and you had to show your ID. And I showed my ID, and the guy said no, like no, you can't come in. I, and I was like, I was like, why? I mean, you know, my ID. I was 21 years old, and he goes, he goes no. I said, do you think this is fake or something? I mean, this is like a California driver's license. And he goes, no, you're Mallory on Family Ties, and Mallory isn't 21. And I was like, oh. I was like, oh my god. Well, like, I mean, and, and that was that. It wasn't like, ah ha ha. And then I went in. No, that was that. I didn't, I didn't get to go into the club. Oh. That's why this book I think is so fascinating and so unique. And you know, for a long time, way back when I reviewed books at the LA Times, and it's really a unique kind of book because it blends this, you know, sort of heady sociology and it's backed by by that rigorous stuff. But then it's got these really specific examples that shines a light on it. And wow, now I get it. You know, um, I want to ask you about how celebrities relate to each other within the sheen. You call it a sheen of fame. Um, throughout the book, she refers to it as being a case. Fame is like being encased in a sheet. Sheath. Yeah. Or sheath, sorry. Ooh, it was two letters off. A sheath. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, on the one hand, uh, she mentions in the book how celebrities, when they see each other out in the world, might there might be eye recognition and sort of an eye roll, and especially in a crowd, like, I, the head nod, I get it. I see where you're coming from, sort of. Um, and on the other end of that spectrum, when there's a disparity between famous people's level of fame, there's an interesting dy dynamic that can happen. There, she talks about being at a party in 2007-ish. Yeah. Um, I, I want to say before I forget, sure. there's an excellent podcast on Hidden Brain, NPR Hidden Brain, titled Don't Go to Vegas or Never Go to Vegas. And I can't remember the sociologist's name that, that did this interview, but she talks about, they did a study on famous people, they, they qualified them as A-list, B-list, C-list, and, um, and, and, and looked at who hangs out with whom. And it was really interesting, and the second half of it is all about uh, participating in certain uh, areas of society and how you qualify for those, like, like the aspirational yoga mat, Whole Foods group. And anyway, it's a very interesting thing that taps into to your question there. Um, but yes, it, it, it can feel for someone for whom this is part of the descent that then um, in the presence of other famous people, um, I did have experiences that it might have been in my own head, but this is what it felt like, that it was almost like um, not wanting to catch because fame is so ephemeral and you can't control it. You can't bring it upon yourself and you also can't dispel it. Um, it's like energy, like it will just do what it's gonna do. But going to a party, one of the times I realized that I was in the descent was a, sort of a, a reticence of people who were presently famous or at the level that I had once been at to really talk to me at length. Now again, this might have been all in my own head, but it was a sense that I got, and I was like, wow, I don't blame them, because you have no, it's, fame is, you can't control it, and it's also for performers, so much, um, such a, a highly valued currency with, for your vocation, for your financial security, that you just do not want to mess around with it, you know? So if in their heads they're thinking, oh, if I, if I talk too long with somebody who's not, who's, who's in the descent of the fame life cycle, maybe I'll catch it. it I kind of got that sense, which, which ties into, I forget the term, but um, we'll, you know, through evolution, we have avoided those who have contagious diseases. But then unfortunately, we take that, that means by which we've survived and we apply it to other things, like people who don't have contagious diseases, people who just got divorced. You know, it's like, Jesus, well, I don't want that to, you know, uh, I don't want that to flow over into my marriage, or you know, whatever we might be thinking, but, and, and it, it ties into I this want to catch famous thing too. And, to the, and, and on the flip side, wanting to be around famous people so that some of us, some of that could maybe flow over us Maybe we'll catch some of it, right? So it's a very strange thing. I guess I, I'm wondering, what was that like? Was it, it when you found yourself in the so-called descent on the other side of that? Was that 
disappointing or was it a struggle or was it a relief? Like, oh, no, I can go to the, what was that like for you? Oh, no, it was, it was, now when I say it like this, it's not because like, oh, I couldn't get reservations at a restaurant like I could before, anything like that. But it was, it was incredibly upsetting for the reasons, don't just take that quote, for the reasons I said before about reality, uh, elements that are foundational to your reality. Because I was having an element that had been foundational to my reality for more years than it hadn't been, right? I got, you know, the fame started at 16, so this is like I'm in my mid to late 30s when I start to feel that. And it's like, it's it can incite panic because you're like, wait, this thing that was so much a part of my life is now going away. Nobody's going to sympathize with you. You can't talk about it with anybody, really. You can't even talk about it with other famous people because then you, they might get the old, you might get the old, like, well, you know, not wanting to be around. So it's like you're saying, like, I think I'm coming down with a cold, you know? And you go, well, don't come over today then. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's Let's talk alienating. again when you feel better, you know, because you don't want to catch it. Um, but yeah, I found, you know, and you see in the book, like, I really had to process. Uh, and this is true when anything sort of um, imbalances me in my life, I want to get to the root of what the fear is. Because then I can, because I want to be, I personally want to be, I don't want to change other people's behavior, I want to change the number of buttons I have. So that I can be in a situation where somebody says, uh, boy, you're brother's doing great, but your career, what happened? Or, That's my next question. <laughs> you are making <laughs> it so easy. See, I can even say it myself, and I'm like, questionable. now, like, I don't have that button anymore. Like, I don't really give a shit if somebody says that to me, because then I, I know now they're telling me more about themselves than me. They're telling me how they treat themselves, and they're also telling me that they don't know how to use Google and to see what I have done in my career since I, I stopped acting. <laughs> Which I want to ask Which is you, writing and directing and producing question. in college and, you know, all of that stuff. The computer science degree, the digital media management. Um, but you mentioned your brother, and I, I had a question about, I, it started with my curiosity about how men and women ride the fame cycle differently. And then, what a great example, you know, your brother is an actor as well. Um, and I'm wondering, and you started as, as kid actors together. Um, and so, did you notice that it was different for him in, in going riding that fame arc? Is it harder for a woman to sort of rise and then come to the other side? Or I don't really know because I, I didn't happen to look at it as a um, uh, with that distinction of male or female because I don't ever look at stuff myself like that. Like I don't care about sexism because if somebody says something to me that someone else would deem sexist to me, it just means don't do a deal with this person, go around them, go to someone else. Mm -hmm. Like, it, they're just telling, I'm just getting saved from a, from a probably lame kind of work situation. So, but I will say there is a difference between uh, my brother and I, the fame, and I wouldn't qualify it as male or female, but rather my fame went up very fast, very high, and Jason's was more of a slow burn. And so, and, and also his came to a height later, uh, at a later age than mine had. And so then he was, he was just by, by virtue of his age, uh, at a, in a more mature place to not only manage it, but use it. So he's taken his and, um, and transformed it into, uh, development deals and now when and you know and he's got this fantastic company development deals with uh, Netflix he's got Ozarks I'm sure you guys have all seen um, continues to do the Arrested Development the series he's got another series he's producing on HBO I mean he's just I don't know how he has time to eat it's pretty rad he's done he's done a great job at um, taking that fame and and uh, using it in such a way, uh, investing it into his career in a very, very long-term way. Um, for me, I was younger and also it was so much at once that all I could do was just try and manage myself within that. I, I wasn't even thinking about um, converting it. <laughs> 
I just didn't have, I couldn't get arm's length enough with it to be able to convert it in the way that he's been able to. Did you feel any sort of sense of relief? Sort of when... Uh, I'll tell you when the relief came. After I did the work that I go into detail in the book on myself about, you know, trying to remove those buttons and what's my core fear, why am I, why is it bothering me, or why am I feeling less than, or why am I, uh, why is my uh, self-identity being affected by this? Once I got on the other side of that stuff, like, you know, and where I continue to be now, yeah, that's a super duper relief because, um, to use an unscientific term, because the people ple or the the people pleasing that winds up being a natural byproduct of trying. You mentioned earlier about people getting disappointed when they meet you. Yeah. I mean, nobody likes that feeling of having. You know, again, we go back to like the first time your parent said to you, "Oh, we're really we're not angry at you, honey. We're just disappointed." And you're like, "God, that's worse. Like, just be right. mad at me and punish me. I don't want to hear you disappointed me." So. As somebody who's, when somebody's famous, you know, they might come across that all the time. And they want to sort of mitigate that. So you wind up trying to be what you think these people want you to be, or, you know, it's a form of people pleasing, obviously. So to be on the side of it and not people please at all. Like if somebody asks a question now that's like, I don't want to answer, I just go pass. I don't try to go like, well, um, let me see. You know, like that photo shoot I mentioned earlier, like, okay, well, I don't want to make this uncomfortable, so I'll just go ahead and do the photo shoot. I'll just get on the other side. It's like, yeah, now you're going to live with it for a month on the newsstand. Are you happy? You know. And in the book, she has there are a bunch of photos in the middle, and those two shoots we talked about are side by side. They're very different photographs. Um, and that, was, and that was, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't about the people that that were doing the doing that sort of